welcome back. It's Christina again with the Artist Pod, and today we're going to talk about how to draw a cassowary. So, let's get arting. All right, so here is the cassowary. I know my um, color swatches over here look a little crazy, but I was really working on trying to decide what color they actually are. They have a weird kind of greenish blue head that goes into a darker blue neck with some pink, uh, gray beak, gray and brown head crest. Um, there's some orange behind, but I don't know that I'm going to include that black feather. So, um, very interesting bird. So we're actually going to start with the head. Now they have the grayish that kind of goes all the way back into into here. I have this sort of jagged line. And it's definitely interesting. Um, this is all skin, so their feathers don't actually kick in around their neck. Um, there's some like wispy feathers through here, but a lot of this is going to be skin. I'm Still going to do it the way like we did the monkey right, like I'm still doing those in-between strokes um, and following the contour. And then that crest kind of comes up. Their skin has a lot of wrinkles, so we might be adding in um, some wrinkles in the highlights and shadows. So, but again, because it's skin, right, I don't have to, oh, I think I've actually drawn through, no, I haven't. Because it's skin, I don't have to worry about how long I'm making the strokes. So this is under um, the beak, kind of on the opposite side. There's a, a kind of an, a recessed flap here, the way their, their bodies work. So this is going to be in an extreme shadow. Just need to be mindful of that as I go further on. Their bodies kind of create, it's almost a nice, neat um, little recess there for the shadow. There will always be a shadow under the beak unless the light's coming from um, uh, beneath them. But um, this particular bird makes it nice and easy. Hmm. I actually probably should transition to the darker. Probably should have transitioned a little higher. I think it kicks in more like around up here. But it's a subtle transition, so you know, having some underbase of a different color might not be a, a bad thing. So I bring this line down right like I'm curving inward. I have um, some of this in place. I'm not sure yet if I'm going to put some of the black of the uh, feathers coming off the back to help balance it. It's such a long, narrow composition. I'm not fully sold on if I like it uh, yet or not. Um, and I may decide that I do not. Now we'll get into the beak. They have a little ridge here on their nose. And their beak, the nose part of their beak. <laughs> I haven't really sketched them with any feathers, so I'm not really limited by brush st or stroke length, right? Like, we'll see if I add those black feathers in, that'll change it, but it's not going to be a lot even if I do. I'm going to add some gray. Sometimes hard to tell when you're Googling what's normal and what's not. You're doing research, but I think there is some gray here on their little head crest. That transitions into a brown. No, there is a little yellow burst. This random yellow spot. And there's this pinkish coloration that kicks in. 
and these little like flaps as they're coming down. It'll actually add a nice burst of a of a different color lower down, especially because the eyes are brown, so it'll add just a little bit of a extra pop elsewhere. If these weren't so far down, I could make the top a little bigger. I guess I could have hidden these, but it seemed important. Okay, it says I saw some orange against his beak, so I'm going to do that. And then we'll fill in the rest of his little crest with it. So as I bring this down, I'm actually looping it in. It makes it, again, that quicker motion. Especially since this isn't fur, it's actually going to be a, um, a harsher line as it runs into each other, right? Like you have a beak and skin running into this crest thing. Now I know I talk about it a lot, but here I'm trying to avoid line conflict by building this up in a certain way. As I curve, I'm probably going to have all the lines kind of converging on this point. And so I'm just making sure my lines make sense for that. I'm going to go ahead and add just a few of the darker feathers. I think that's really going to help give it some form, even on that back side. Now the feathers here are behind, but it's going to help lend some... I don't have to do much. I think just a little bit is going to work here. Underneath and along here. These feathers come in. some illusion of um, space back here and shape. Yeah, I think even doing that gives a little bit more shape. A trick when you're, you're sort of, you know, coming up with a, a space to cut it off is you don't want it to bow, right? Like I don't want it to end up where it's cut like that and I have form here because that looks strange to us. What I find helps is if it, it kind of goes the other way and then kind of fade it off, right? You can see that I'm, I'm kind of fading it out by putting less and less strokes. And I'm going to kind of do that as I bring this out. Gives it more form. You can go too far, so I just also need to make sure I don't do too much of that. That might be a little much. That's fine, so let's just bring this up. Leave him a little narrower. Yeah, there we go. And you get a sense. You may add some of the orange you can see behind him, but it really kind of depends on the angle if you can see it or not. Now the trickier part is going to be in adding in all of the details in the skin, so that's going to be a fun little thing. Now, um, it was a fast sketch, right? <laughs> Go back to here. Now, because his head, the way his head's turned, here, right, um, I could have the light source coming from over here. And it probably still would hit. But his head's turned just a little bit towards us. I don't have it completely flat to us. So if I want to make sure I am shadowing this in a way that's going to give me the best possible highlight and stay true to his form, I really probably should have the light source from coming from over here. Which is usually what I do, right? So if I'm in a situation where I've turned a subject just a little bit, I always consider what that means um, as far as the light goes. Do I need to do something? Do I need to, to change what I've done? Um, change what direction I'm drawing from? Because I always want to make sure my subject's the most important thing. That's what I'm drawing. That's how wherever I place the light source, it should be the best for that subject. So in this case, we'll have it from over here. And like always, that means it's coming from above and in front of, not behind not from, you know, behind over here, not from behind over here, not from straight beside. Um, and I think that'll do the best 
to give me the best um, light. All right. Now, as always, as it comes down by the eye, it's going to have just a little bit of shadow, but he has some wrinkling by his eye. I'm going to create a little burst. And then he has an additional wrinkling underneath, but that is a separate wrinkle set. <laughs> now, an easy way to kind of mimic a texture in the skin. Let me zoom in. What I'm doing here is I'm doing ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs and tying them together like this. Up, down. So I'm doing up, down, up, but bunching them together. What that's allowing me to do is to mimic this sort of textured effect. Give some you know, variation to the skin. And see when you pull back, you can kind of see that. That's what you want. It's a quick way to do it. You can certainly do it much more in depth, but he has a whole lot of that happening. And uh, it, it would take a long time to do that fully, all of those wrinkles all over him. So this is a quick way to do it. Um, without taking the, the extra time, basically. It's the lazy way of, of adding in wrinkles onto skin. Now I'm gonna feather this out, right? All um, light sources on the edge will be in shadow. That's no exception. And then as we come towards the beak, tip of his beak's gonna be in uh, shadow. Just like always, I have to make sure I've feathered it out right. So they do have a little like ear here. This might be too bright. I might end up taking this out. Um, I haven't decided yet. And of course they have that change of color. But otherwise still the, the wrinkliness happening. Now as we come under, right, this is gonna be in shadow. And then, of course, as it comes down on this side, this is all going to be in shadow. I'm going to match it to the edge of that um, beak a bit at first, but it's going to be coming in a little bit more. Right, there's that extreme shadow, but as the skin kind of more becomes more rounded, it'll push the um, highlight further in. But not all the way over, because we're going to want some shadow here. Because the skin is so bumpy, it's not straight, which is a little easier to make it happen, too, especially with this um, style of drawing, this sort of back and forth. It creates natural bumps in the texture. And that's going to increase as we bring it down here. This is going to start really kicking in to a um, shadow as the neck is sort of rounding downwards, completely away from the light source. Obviously, this takes just a little longer, so it's not, if I were just doing straight up strength, uh, skin strokes, um, this would go pretty quick. But by adding this effect, I can't go too long or I lose, um, you know, like, I can't make these long strokes and keep that texture. So they have to be shorter by their nature. And then within this, you know, we might be able to still add some highlights and shadows to some specific wrinkling as well. So all down in here is going to be in shadow. I'm just sorting out where the shadow and the highlight would transition. Just like always, that means I'm putting lesser pin pressure as I work this up. Still trying to make sure that you get the textured effect by changing my strokes around. But at least on this back side of this, um, you know, this is a ridge. You can kind of see that I have some shadowing up in here. This is also a ridge, but you can't see the back side of this one. But there would be just a little bit of shadowing. 
Now let's see if we can add thicker lines to create the illusion of bigger, more defined wrinkles. It's easier to do that in where I have the um, shadow, right? Like in the shadow areas, it's just a matter of adding a little highlight. It's easy enough to do elsewhere, but um, the easiest where there's some tapering off, then I can really bolster up a section. And so just by doing that, you have a little burst of texture. So now we'll just work on these um, pinkish dangle thingies. I don't know what they're called. Backside though, because they're um, an object that's kind of off the skin, right? Like it's the all chickens, I guess not all chickens, but these guys have it. Chickens have it. Because it's detached from the skin, there'd be a shadow on the backside. It's its own three-dimensional object, so there might be a little shadowing on the front as well. When you're doing one like this, where it's kind of in the middle of another area and it's thinner, sometimes you can fudge the shadow on the highlighted side a bit. It won't be as noticeable if you put a full highlight. Um, because you sometimes you know you just don't have enough room to work with and it still reads kind of the right way but we're going to try especially because it widens out so much the tip is also going to be in shadow because it's aimed down kind of do the same thing over here but this one's further further off to the side shadow will likely be a bit deeper on the back side we're going to kind of match it to the little bit of highlights of blue I put down here already. All right, now we'll get into the beak. This tip here is going to be in shadow because this beak is turned away from the light source. And of course underneath. And then, you know, where its mouth comes in, there's going to be some shadowing where just like, um, you know, any mouth where you have sort of this little dip in as it goes towards the recess of the mouth itself before we have any highlights or shadows. Probably a little burst of highlight under. So we work the bottom beak back out of the shadowed area. So it's gonna go into shadow over here. And of course it's gonna almost immediately or very quickly go into shadow underneath. But I need to indicate that this is a you know a change. A, a, where his beak goes into his mouth. Just gonna get that little burst of yellow. Right here on his beak, and then we'll go on to the brown of his crest, and of course the edge of the crest, again in shadow, but where it connects to the head here, probably not because it would hit that light there, the way that would go. It might be a little bit of one, but it's not going to be significant. I might have to do a little just to indicate that there's a change, but otherwise. Not putting full pin pressure as I put the um, brown into the gray. I'm just sort of lightly pushing it in. It's in a shattered enough spot that it should help um, blend the effect. May do the same with the gray um, on the other side, but for the moment it seems working. <laughs> yeah, looks like a proper dinosaur. 
not going to do much to the gray here, but I do want it to be obvious that it's there. So I'm just going to fill out just a little bit of it. And I'm going to allow it to fade out as I push away from the center of the composition. Actually, I am going to push some of this gray into the brown. It looks so jarring at the moment. I'm not quite happy with the full result. So we're going to just push some of this into it. See how that does. Could also change the color, turn it more grayish. That definitely tempers some of the brown. Doesn't look quite as out of place. Now we're going to make some adjustments as to where um, the blue and this greenish color are kicking in. And then we will work on the eye. Just have to find the right layer. All right. Now, your eyes are brown. Just make sure I can see I'm not on the right layer. Sometimes I forget to do that. That's why I flash the layers on and off so much. Now, because of how I was facing, if I just put the eye in the middle like this, it's going to look like it's looking forward. So to make it look like it's looking at us, I'd need to move it a little bit more like that. It may still look like it's not quite looking at us, but it'll be a little closer. And then we're just going to fill in the space around it. As I do it, typically don't want a straight line, right? Like you have a hump with the eye. And inevitably what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this up just a little bit and then I'm going to try and match that angle just a bit. Not fully, but I'm going to create a um, a rounding to it. Otherwise it looks too static, almost too arbitrary, like someone's drawn it in instead of natural, and I don't really want that to look that way, so I have to adjust. Sometimes, especially with birds, I'll draw in the whole eye. That can be effective too, as long as you create a big shadow up here. Because with them, um, the Shadowing on the top of the eye isn't always as extreme as it is for mammals because of how their eyes are. So um, sometimes I'll do that, especially because sometimes I'll just have a big, it'll be a big space and it'll just look better with a circle. It may still work. You can see there it'll work just fine. It just shows that it's, it's casting a, a deep shadow. Or I could finish it off and just have this going into an, a more extreme shadow than below. Since I rarely do that, I might do that for this one just to fully show it. And really taper this off because there would be some shadowing. And I don't want it to look like I've created a line. See the problem with that, and you can see it with this, and the reason I often don't do it is he, he looks kind of bug-eyed. Like he's surprised by us, whereas just by taking that away it changes his expression significantly, right? Like if we come in here and we look at how he's looking, we add it all the way in, he looks startled. Here he looks, eh, disinterested. Or, you know, curious enough, but not too curious. That's why sometimes all you have to do to change an emotion is change how much of this is showing. So I might bring this up just a little bit more so he doesn't look completely bored with us. He can look at least a little excited, but not so much that it fully fills it in. And then as always, I take the select tool and I just sort of fill in the gap, except I want to make sure it's the size of the pupil. It's going to be a little bit bigger, but that's okay because I want to erase out some of my own strokes here to make it perfectly straight. If I decide to put this back in, it's still there. In fact, I might go ahead and do the same for the top, just to have it ready. Now, um, you know, light source coming from over here, right, instead of to the other side. So that burst of light on the pupil is going to be on this side. It's always on the side that's opposite the light source. That's to create um, 
the illusion of recess coming back into the light. You know, that lip of that eye of the pupil coming back into the light would catch the light. And then we highlight it on this side. Be a little bit of shadow going in on this rim. Nothing too major before it goes back into shadow. And then, of course, the highlight on the eye itself would come all the way under. And as we start rounding to this side, we start getting um, shadow. And the edges, you get shadow as well. So as I come to the edge, I'm also going to lessen my pin pressure. So all the way under, I want to make sure it connects to this light, this little highlight here, because otherwise, if I don't, you know, temper this out, it'll look too much. It'll be too jarring. So I'm going to uh, lessen that out as well. Make sure that light source, that light on the eyes, coming all the way under, without going all the way to the edge. Just, uh, there we go. Little. Uh, too extreme of an angle in the shadow. And now we start to bring it off, making sure that this timbers out and lessening our the pin pressure. And so if we didn't add, it, add in the top, you can see how much more shadowed that is. So it may work as long as we keep the shadow pretty Stream, but I need to fill in some gaps. And then the light flare. The light flare always goes on the side of the light source, opposite that little bright highlight we put against the pupil. And there we go. All right, so that is how you draw a cassowary. I hope that was helpful. In the floating nether next to me, I have other videos of art tutorials I have done, and I will see you all soon. Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs>